So here's a serious philosophical poem, an Easter poem, Strange Accounting. Grieving tomcat flattened in the road Easter morning, I told over the litany of his many names and nicknames and wept harder at daffodil. His orange tabby patches and white roundnesses, the blameless pink of his nose and mouth and ears, had all suggested increase of blooming and brightness. Amid the lilies, I always forget, this is my season of loss, of wondering what to do with loss, of watching as the cosmic accounts are reconciled by means of a heroic and terrible dying. I struggle to understand this system of bookkeeping. Still, the ultimate audit intrigues me. And that night, I reread the Franciscan who says that when you are resurrected, all that your heart has loved is resurrected with you. And so I pray for salvation, not so much for my own body as for the eventual unburying of fur, of purr and pink and scamper, and the everness of springtime without passing. For you, Aaliyah, I thought of you a lot this springtime. Springtime sort of sucks and it shouldn't, and it does. And yeah. So I have um, a, a series of poems I've been working on recently that are persona poems, and I, they're spoken through this character I've invented named Amanda Bubble. And I don't know why her name is Amanda Bubble. It, the name just sort of into my head. I thought, oh, that sounds like a fun name to work with. And it's, she's turned out to be super useful um, because she gets to say things that I don't. I'm a middle-aged mom and there are just certain things I probably shouldn't say, though I say them sometimes anyway. I don't recite Philip Larkin poems to my eight-year-old, for example. I don't want to give him that sort of ammunition. The time will come. The time will come, but not yet. He could take oh, them to show and tell. 14 or so. <laughs> What's that? He could take them to show and tell. He could take them to show and tell. Oh, my gosh. So when my chapbook came out um, in June last year, he was, he was very excited that I mentioned him in the acknowledgments, and I didn't know it, but I signed a, I sent a copy for him, and I didn't know that he stuck it in his backpack and took it to school for show and tell. He, thought, he was very interested in being famous, and he thought that if I mentioned him in the acknowledgments of my book, he was going to be famous. And I'm like, honey, you're only going to be as famous as your mama. And he doesn't know about your mama jokes yet, so that's good. But um, So he, he stands up and passes this thing around his classroom for show and tell. And he told me after school, and thank goodness the teacher intercepted it. I said, page 40, there's the word fuck is on page 40. You can't let this, the children, they're second grade, last year the first graders, right? So anyway, saved. But I thought, OK, here come the complaint calls from the other parents when their children tell them what John Benjamin brought to school. Anyway, Amanda Bubble is probably 20 years younger than myself, maybe an alternate version. Um, and she's sort of philosophical. Like me, she'd love to be able to write stories. But like me, she couldn't narrate her way out of a paper bag. Um, she's really interested in that. She's um, spiritually seeking and spiritually troubled. Um, she gets to talk about her um, troubled relationship with her father um, and sort of delve into other things that it's not, um, not safe for me to do in my own voice. Amanda Bubble is always in hot water. Cleanliness is next to, father's gold teeth would admonish. In the shower, my bar of ivory would bowl for bottles of shampoo. This was a true indicator of the condition of my soul and not my only slip up. Once, mother's silver razor leapt up and bit me bloody. Before all my toes and fingers yelped, hey there, body, we need you to stick around and sign our paychecks. Oh, I remember the slurred exhortations no hitting, no running. That was during prohibition. Those warnings bore repeating like an oar or a paddle. Between the toothbrush and the loofah, I was pretty much a wash. You guys, you don't, like, you don't have to clap between poems. It's okay. You can't tell the 
So one thing Amanda Bubble does is she gets angry at people in her church and she resigns her church membership. Um, that's in another poem that I didn't happen to bring with me tonight. But in, in this poem, Amanda Bubble considers what was good about going to church. I liked that everything was turning into something else. I was becoming a believer in the one big body. All of us growing into various limbs and organs of one beloved, yearning for bridegroom Christ and a strange consummation. And that so much of church was about food, coffee hour, communion, the grand picnic narratives of the Gospels. The net dragged up full and every loaf dividing, dividing and replicating to feed the growling multitude. Each Sunday, the priest said, here, eat a little piece of a God. Drink him down and keep him alive in your body. So I digested him and metabolized him in my cells. Over and over, I split him into future versions of myself. You are what you eat, the nutritionists in town. Does that mean you eat what you are? What you are trying to be? Thank you. And because Amanda Bubble is always struggling with her spirituality, Amanda Bubble is always revising her credo. Jesus loves me this I'm pretty sure of. Also, that he will mess me up if I cross him. And after, piece me back down. It's true that he will bring to justice those responsible, especially himself. Maybe he came down here just to share the contents of his vast pocket of lonely. Maybe he wanted to wear a body unbearable in all its knowing. Or maybe not, since in April, even the fir trees raise their green middle fingers to the sky. I'm lucky I noticed this in time. Oh, the beautiful miles sprint and wheel. How many times can a universe spin without wobbling? Meanwhile, the birch trees are knocking each other up right here in the park. Most don't mind, but my nose feels embarrassed. The difference is something else. The difference is that God is good, and apparently he is doing this for my own. Meanwhile, I wonder who let the money out. Again and again, I marvel at the green. Thank you. One thing I've been having a lot of fun doing the last few years is reading mythology. Um, I never studied it in school for some reason, and I don't know if it's even taught in schools anymore, but I had about three weeks of it in sixth grade, thought it was fascinating, and then we moved on. Um, but the past few years I've been um, reading mythology, Norse mythology and some um, Hindu mythology, and mostly Greco-Roman mythology, um, which has some fascinating and horrifying stories in it. Um, I'm also really interested in origin stories, where a culture will use um, various stories to probably pose, question, pose answers to the question, how did we come to be who we are in this place? So stories of origin are fascinating to me. Um, and lots of Lots of cultures have stories about leaving a paradise. What, what did we do to get ourselves kicked out of this place? Um, and gee, things used to be better, and now they're sort of horrible. And how did that happen? This poem is titled, 10 Great Gifts for the Woman Who Has Nothing. For the journey out, figs. Fig leaves for carrying the blame. A womb and a man worthy to name it. Another rib and even more backbone. The pomegranate, secrets still intact. Anklet of snakeskin, woven bracelet of grass. 
A circlet of worry for her newly conscious brow, for her hair still smelling of blossoms and smoke. So one particularly horrifying story I ran across um, in Greek myths is the, the story of two sisters named Procne and Philomela. And there are a bunch of different variants of that story um, from different time periods in different countries. But um, they're two sisters. One of them marries the king, King Tereus. And King Tereus rapes the other sister, the one he didn't marry. And to prevent her from telling, cuts out her tongue. Well, the sisters get their revenge, among other things, they feed the king's baby to him on a platter, and he doesn't know that it's baby on his dinner table. So that's certainly Yummy. revenge. Yeah. Um, the other thing the sisters do is they weave a tapestry that depicts the story of, of what happened. And the gods, of course, are all observing this from on high, and they're realizing the king is going to take revenge on the sisters for taking revenge on the king. And so the gods turn the sisters into birds, and according to which variant um, you're looking at, one of the sisters gets turned into a nightingale, and the other sister gets turned into a swallow. The swallows are birds that I love in the Northwest. Um, apparently they go to places in Mexico and Central America during the winter. And right now during April they come back here and I always watch for them. They're beautiful. Um, whenever I see them now I think of this horrible um, story about the two sisters, Procne and Philomela, um, and try to appreciate these tiny beautiful birds apart from that story. But I think birds show up in, myth, in myths and stories and there are imaginative lives so much because, um, because we give them meaning. So that's one thing I'm doing in this next poem, which is titled, I have to take a deep breath before this title, Among Swallows and Horses, Working Out My Post-Critical Subjecthood. The swallows swivel and bank out and back in while I muck the horse stalls. No longer emblems of Procne or Philomela, the swallows signal only that the bugs have hatched, that they have returned to catch them, 60 mosquitoes and flies per hour each to feed to their hatchlings. All eyes and beaks, the cup-nested young perch in the barn rafters, and between their noisy feedings, watch me interrogate my good luck to be working among horses and the soft bodies of birds. Is it wrong to want to say that they mean something other than their otherness from me? In ancient times, the stories linked humans to every conceivable type of wing. A professor taught me that myth-making is the verbal construction of hegemony over the unknowable. This was one way in which going to graduate school was like taking your inner child to be circumcised. First the liturgy, then sharpness and shrieking. But keeping covenant carries risk in exchange for new ways of getting your questions answered. And still, theories drift down to me like small feathers while I rake and shovel below the nests, like blessings soft even to a girl bereft of her time. So I've been writing a lot of persona poems, and in reading up about um, Greek and Roman myths, I learned about Artemis, um, who's probably, that's her Greek name, she's more, better known probably, um, as Diana, which is her Roman name. And um, Diana is the goddess of the hunt. And she is the protector of women in childbirth, and perhaps paradoxically, also the protector of virgins. Um, I heard about a date rape that happened in Bellingham and was moved to write a note from Artemis. Sister, I am the other girl in your dream about your classroom or lab or film studio gone grim. 
Tonight's lesson or scene is how the upstanding, charismatic man turns creep. He intends to make you unlearn yourself. He intends to infect you with his undead blood. He will reach for your ankle as you scoot uphill. He will nip at your collar if you depart from his script. He wants what he wants, and he wants you to bleed. Remember, I am a power belonging to you. Remember when you notice you're forgetting to breathe. I will hunt him. I will halt him. I will smash his predator teeth. with um, two uh, last persona poems um, written in the voice of a, of a goddess, an ancient goddess, who's sort of a mashup of Mediterranean regional goddesses mixed maybe with some Western European ones. Um, she hasn't said much in recent centuries, and she had a few things to say. Plus, I had a lot of fun. This one's called Some Friend. <laughs> the goddess is monologuing here. Some friend. Towards Helen, I am peeved. She refuses to participate in my mythopoesis. She told me, honey, last time you took up that project, your wings went all waxy. True, but someone was bursting an ibex, and I couldn't be bothered. The fact is, she doesn't approve of the way my three breasts line up. She says I'd need nine heads and two more guitars even to begin to pull off the cubist effect. Can a girl just get a little veneration? When we were kids, Helen Flat refused to play loom and spindle with me, even when I said she could be weaver woman of the universe. She still gets snide when I embroider any yarn. She dislikes my searching for the fragments of Osiris and remembering his torn body. But the last straw seemed to be when I pleaded her to bridesmaid my next wedding to a new druid king. You see, as priestess queen, at the end of his short reign, I sacrificed him to ensure good harvest. Helen snorted, girlfriend, there is no way in God's green erogenous zone I will tart up so you can knock off another monarch in his prime. I begged, but the old symbols, they're falling away. Please, won't you reenact for the sipped cup even just one of the old-time rituals? Helen replied with a stop head, stop hand and a shake head saying, Love girl, I'm not that into you. But all I want is reverence where reverence is due. Thank you. My last poem is from the goddess again. Um, she's still seeking reverence. Cover letter from the goddess. Dear prospective employer, after some two millennia away to raise my sons, I seek to re-enter the workforce of the paid. To your team, I bring sheaves of wheat and solar panels, as well as new remedies for your seasonal allergies. I produce at the rate of one new king every fourth winter, and a new crop of candidates every fourth spring. If you are a locavore, I can grow an entire village for you to eat. I can stem your flood of customer complaints and bloom wherever you choose to plant the pieces of my brother. I have a strong record of making ends meet beginnings and holding it all together on a shoestring. For compensation, I expect an executive range. Three to 13 members in upper management annually should meet my needs. I invite you to a luncheon interview on Aventine Hill at your convenience. Please bring wine, oil, and a white bull calf, and my slim assistants will greet you from the trees. Thank you very much.